It already it works. Yeah, it works. Okay, we're gonna get started. Is Mike working okay? Um, can you shut that door around there? Yeah, shut that door. Shut the door behind you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay, so here's some crap. Uh, I guess they got it working, Bob. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It does work. Okay. Um, I didn't get fired after my introductions yesterday, so I'm still here. Um, this is, you guys know what this tape is? A special tape from the EFF with the Fourth Amendment on it. I get in a lot of trouble for showing, showing stuff, but we're insured this year, I found out. So. <laughs> Men's extra large. Decals. Who wants decals? All right, come on up and get them. Here we go. And the 47th copy of Network Security Assessment that I've given out at Shmoocon. If you already have this, but I think I've given one to everybody here, so. <laughs> I'm, what's going to happen is I'm going to throw it to you and I'm going to hit somebody else. Get up here. Come on. <laughs> I always hit the wrong guy. Okay, and then another uh, men's large. Fight for it. So how do we open the presentation on the monitor we can't see? Yeah, my pleasure. Okay. Okay, these guys, I honestly can't introduce at all because I don't really know what they're talking about. I'm sorry about that. Okay, so I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Yeah, and you, know, you want to, one of you guys want to kick me off stage right now? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, it's empty. Uh, I didn't wear my gun because I wasn't sure about the uh, jurisdictional issues. The uh, retired law enforcement carry act was passed a few years ago, but we see just some funny regulations. Can you hear me now? Hello? Yes? Hey? Yeah, better? Okay. I it just, I didn't wear my gun because uh, I wasn't sure jurisdictional issues, that's why. So, but I just wanted to show what I used to look like. I'm uh, Frank Thornton. I'm the. Uh, the gumshoe in this presentation. My partner here is uh, Mike Shearer. He's the uh, uh, geek in this presentation. We're going to be talking about computers and law enforcement. Let me just get this going. Here. <laughs> just switch, just close off the other monitor. I mean, yeah, I can't even want to go to that. There we go. Yeah, the display properties. There. 
Okay. You want to kick off this portion? Sure, sure. Right. I want to talk about a little bit about um, what the, the topic that we're going to talk about today and, and why we're here. Um, last, um, last July and, and, and August, and uh, there was a series of... Um, convenience store robberies going on in my, home, in my hometown of State College, Pennsylvania. And uh, when, as I, when I got to DEF CON, uh, Thorne and I started talking about, you know, about serial crime. And um, we just, you know, kind of evolved into, you know, mapping crime and what you could do with mapping crime. And maybe if you had enough serial crimes, could you perhaps you know, plot these crimes on a map and, and kind of predict where the offender lived based on these crimes. So we talked a little bit about more about that. And basic, what, it, what it basically evolved into was, was kind of, you know, <laughs> was can, can you use mathematics and computers to help solve crimes? Um, if you've seen the TV show Numbers, which is on Friday nights, um, you know, it's pretty, it's, it's, it's your typical, you know, Hollywood presentation of, of a crime drama with a twist, and that's using a mathematician to aid the FBI in solving crimes. And, you know, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, reality and perception, in, especially in, in TV shows and, and, and how they, you know, glamorize certain things. But really what we want to talk about really is, is the real numbers themselves. In other words, how can you, in fact, you know, can you in fact use math to help solve crimes? You know, we'll talk a little bit about the history and some other information. Uh, I'll do just a little bit about my background. I, I'm not a mathematician, by the way. I'm, I'm fascinated, by, however, by the application of math to real world situations. If you were one of those guys like me in school who always asked, you know, when am I ever going to need to use this? You know, well, there is some real applications of that stuff, and my teachers never told me it, so I wasn't really interested in math, but I am now. I uh, just recently separated from the U.S. Navy, and I'm just start currently starting uh, work for a, a government contractor in Maryland. Uh, so I went from flying an aircraft to flying a desk. Uh, a contributing author to a couple of Singress books, so I'm now an official member of the Singress Authors Club, and... Uh, uh, I'm also a, uh, a football coach and a uh, proud father of three. And next will be uh, the gumshoe. <coughs> Sorry. I just hold it. Okay. So, um, due to my great advanced age, a lot of my friends uh, tend to ask me about my career in law enforcement. Uh, when did I start? How was how was the Wild West? The Wild West was interesting. Uh, th this is not actually my rookie photograph. This is my grandfather's rookie photograph. So I do uh, come from a slightly closer area. Uh, that, that is a rookie photograph for me in the summer of about 1982 or 83. And yes, that is in fact a six gun on my hip. And we did carry the bullets that way on the belt back in those days. Um, so I started back in the 1980s uh, as a cop. Um, I had started before that as a, uh, uh, a geek, basically, like a lot of people in this room, fiddling around with computers in the 70s, uh, which were mainframes back then. The university had one. Um, I just wanted, this is the next generation, and I'm going to come back to this. This is my son. He's uh, with the uh, NYPD, and uh, this was last Christmas. This is what he was doing. Just having fun out there in the streets. We're going to talk about NYPD. I'm going to come back to that. They're one of the most advanced systems that, that we've got out there doing computer stuff with law enforcement. They're also one of the most backwards because the guys actually that are on street duties actually do typing, like typewriters, for daily reports. But they've also got some very advanced stuff. We're going to come back to that. But so here's my uh, law enforcement background. It was uh, basically. Uh, the 1980s to 2000, um, I've been everything from patrol officer, chief of police. Um, I've 
worked in a forensic lab for five years. I was a homicide investigator for the state of Vermont, level one homicide investigation. Um, I've been fiddling around with computers since 73, and I've actually contributed to uh, an ANSI standard for uh, fingerprint data that gets exchanged with the FBI. So I've, I've got kind of both worlds covered here. Uh, and I'm also, uh, this is my blatant, uh, um, cheerfully blatant plug, I'm also the uh, author of several uh, computer security books, or co -op. So here's our agenda for today. We're going to talk about um, just all this stuff, how it ties together, how the map works, how the computers work, and how some, you know, whether this stuff is doing the right thing or it's doing the wrong thing, you know, that's kind of a moral question that may, maybe we'll entertain, but we, we want to talk about what's actually going on on a hardware level um, and uh, on, on the streets. So, I think it's skip the videos. It, we just skip the videos. Okay, that's good. All right, so, Part of the thing is that police investigations are all about collecting data. Now, if you talk to the average cop and you say that you're in information uh, security or you're, you're, in, you're working in an information uh, business, they'll look at you like you've got two heads. Cops do not think about data as in the way that you guys think about data. They think about it as who, what, when, where, how. But that's also the same stuff that anybody is collecting for basic demographic information, all that kind of stuff. It's exactly the same thing, but they just don't look at it that way for the most part. I used to, I would mention things like this, and people would look at me like, "What are you nuts? We're out there to enforce law. We've got nothing to do with collecting information." Yet everything we do is collecting information day in and day out. You take away an investigator's gun, he can probably do his job. You take away his pencil and his computer nowadays, he can't do his job. <coughs> the police investigations do differ from a lot of other data collection in a couple of key areas. Um, first of all, everyone lies to the police. Everybody lies to the police. Um, we have to separate the lies from fiction, uh, the opinions. Uh, we get false positives all the time. Uh, I can't tell you the number of people I've had confess to from crimes they don't even know about. Um, I've had people that would literally walk up to me and confess to killing Johnny F.K. before they were born, you know, things like that. Um, eyewitnesses have a high credibility with juries and courts, but um, they don't work very well for police for the most part. We love them when we can get them. Uh, someone that's real positive to stand up there and say something. Unfortunately, eyewitnesses have a tendency to to uh, rather contradict each other. Uh, every time I had multiple eyewitnesses, uh, the crime was committed by a tall, short, heavy set, thin, white, black guy who may have been a woman. <laughs> so, um, and then everybody lies to the police, uh, including witnesses that are trying to cover up things about themselves they don't want to discover. And one of the last things is, is if the police departments in, uh, fail in their investigation, overall that can be very dangerous to the public. And then the final thing that makes it difficult for us is that everybody lies to the police. Okay, so sometimes, like I mentioned, you could probably take away a uh, guy's uh, gun, but you can't take away his pencil. Joseph Wambaugh recognized this in one of his uh, novels. Uh, and the cops are starting to recognize this somewhat. But it's still kind of a long way off. Now, he, he mentions here, the clients looked around at the roar of the activity, the grinding paper mill. Paper everywhere. Take away my gun and car, but please don't take my pencils. And that really sums it up, because detectives are out there collecting information. A lot of times they just don't think of it as data. They tend to be more like our friend Sipowitz here, who says, you walked in with a pretty face and information. You can't leave with both. It is changing, but people are starting to finally re recognize that it is, in fact, uh, data that they're working with and they can manipulate. So now the public is starting to realize this because we've got these fun shows like CSI. There's actually a CSI effect that prosecutors talk about in uh, court. Juries want to see fun stuff where the videos come up 
and we have uh, things flying around on the screen, it's all animated, and the DNA is instantly available, and it just doesn't quite work that way. Um, some of this stuff is true. Uh, we have DNA testing, obviously, nowadays. We have automated fingerprint systems. Um, to, to pick on those two, because they did work closely with those in the forensic laboratory, um, DNA test, testing, some types of it can take literally weeks. It's not like on CSI where they walk in and say, well, here's a match to our bad guy. Doesn't work that way. Uh, APHIS search is very similar. You can get actually several hundred categories that you have to search through by hand. That's narrowed down from tens of thousands, but it's still, you've got to do a hand search uh, and do the final verification based on uh, a person. Um, we've got, you know, things like school associated violence is actually dropping in years. It gets a lot reported more often, but it's actually dropping. Um, and the other thing that, that is percepted by TV shows uh, to the public is that we have a really exciting lifestyle. You know, we get in gun uh, fights all the time. Um, we do get in chases, high speed. I can count on a number of times, on my one hand, the number of times that I actually got involved in uh, gunfights. And I can um, tell you the number of chases I got involved with over a 20-year period is probably of about 10. They're fun when it happens, but it's not like <laughs> <laughs> So, knowing all that stuff, we're going to talk about tools that are available to investigations in the real world and how this stuff actually works. So, time for science. Here's why. I want to start off by, by, by defining math to be very broad. When we're, we're talking about math, we're talking about physics, you know, anything that is using calculations, from simple calculations to advanced computer algorithms, you know, so I want to give you that broad definition, because a lot of stuff we're talking about is not necessarily math at its base, but uses math, you know, for example, accident reconstruction is all about physics, but it really, it's, it's math. Now, math is everywhere, and, 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 and more than just simple addition and subtraction. With the elections going on, there's lots of math, delegate counts, super delegates, proportional allocation of delegates, voting, exit polls, voter identification and analysis. All of this is mathematics that, you know, if you're, if you're a voter, it's directly impacting you. In sports, you have your statistics. Baseball is the sport of sabermetrics. You know, you can, you can look at, uh, you know, a, a chart that I saw recently was, was uh, analysis of, of Roger Clemens, you know, ERA and, and, and WHIP, uh, depending upon where or when he may have taken steroids and whether or not that impacted his career. Uh, betting and sports book, it's all math. The lottery is probability, or perhaps improbability, because lottery math will tell you the best way to, to, to win is not to play the game at all. And then math and advertising. Um, you know, uh, a, company in Germany that's, or you, a company in Germany started determining that uh, you, know, you, could charge for, you could charge more for a billboard if you knew that more people drove by that particular portion of the road. So that billboard now costs more. And now they can find out what sorts of people are driving by that billboard. So they can identify and, and even micro-target that billboard to the types of people that are driving on that road. Um, and then we'll look at these two advertisements. You may have seen this last year. This was an advertisement um, that was put up on a billboard in California. Uh, find the first tangent at prime found in consecutive digits of E, which is based on the natural logarithm. When you figured out that ten-digit sequence and went to that website, there was another math problem, and when you solved that, it was basically a job search for, by Google. They were searching for people who were smart in math. This is an interesting, this is a, a British two-pound coin that came out in 1998. I won't belabor the point too much here, but the coin here was designed as a kind of to show the advances in technology. And actually, you can see on the silver layer there, it's kind of a computer circuit board. And then on the inner layer, you have a series of gears there. Well, if you sat there and counted those gears, you'd find there's 19 gears. If you know how gears work, if one gear works is clockwise, the adjacent one is counterclockwise. So if you start clockwise, counterclockwise, you're going to get to two gears that are supposed to turn clockwise. So those gears will never turn. They didn't realize this until after the, after the you know, coin had been 
printed. So can math and computers really solve crimes, or can they aid in, in criminal investigations? We'll talk about a couple different ways in which uh, math can help solve crimes. We'll, we'll start with a few ways that, that it's already kind of proven that math can help solve crimes. We'll talk about crash reconstruction, so accidents. Anytime there's a serious accident, when there's, you know, especially when there's, you know, there's maybe a death involved, the, the accident reconstructionists are out there. And what are they doing? Well, they're collecting collision evidence. What are, the fit, what are the final positions of the cars or the vehicles involved? Skid marks, measuring the skid marks, finding out is it wet, is it dry, because that changes the coefficient of friction. Roadway markings, what sort of damage are there to vehicles? Damage to property. There's other evidence. W were there witnesses? What do the witnesses say? And again, that kind of adds into what, to what Thorne said. You know, it, you know, if you have three witnesses, you're probably going to get three different stories. So you have to figure out, you know, who's the, who's the, what's the more believable story? That adds in. Traffic control devices that might have been there, weather conditions, lighting issues. Well, how do you, uh, how do you analyze all this once you, you know, collect all this data? Well, you're Newton's laws of motion. It's just basic physics. You know, you can determine the speed of a car generally based on the distance of the skid and the conditions of the road. And there's different techniques you can use. Um, Damage-based and trajectory-based are two, two of the more popular. But uh, there's, 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 a comp there's computer programs out there now that where you can go out to an accident scene, take pictures um, with the camera, upload those pictures to the program, and now the program will kind of 3D model the whole scene for you so that you can kind of tr attempt to reconstruct the accident in a, you know, com a perfect computer environment. Now again, this, you're not going to have all of the data. So this, this is just going to be a simulation of what may have occurred. You're never going to get the exact duplication of what occurred. But you may be able to tell, you know, when, um, you know, who's at fault. Where does this come into play? Well, there were two cases, again, in State College where I live, where this came directly into play. There were uh, three guys uh, that had left the bar. They were all, you know, intoxicated, but not too intoxicated. Uh, started crossing the street. Uh, and uh, they were hit by a vehicle. First guy got killed. Second guy uh, was uh, seriously wounded. And the third guy was just missed. Accident reconstruction in this case proved that they determined how fast this guy was going, found that he, if he was driving the speed limit, he would not have hit any of these guys that were crossing the street. In this case, the guy was charged and found guilty of vehicular homicide. I found another case um, where someone was crossing the street hit by a vehicle. In this case, they found out that the driver was actually going under the speed limit and that it was no, that any reasonable driver in those conditions could not have stopped to hit the pedestrian. In this case, the driver was not charged with anything because it was truly an accident. So you, hear, you see an example here of where uh, accident reconstruction or using math and computers was the difference between a woman being, not being charged and another man being charged with vehicular homicide, where in both cases, the, you know, the, the person, the victim was either seriously injured or killed. Image deblurring. You've seen this scene in Super Troopers. Enhance, enhance, enhance. Well, you know, that's not, to be honest, that's, that's really not too far from the truth. Image, image deblurring has come a long way. Um, uh, if, you use, if you use a program like MATLAB, or uh, there's all sorts of, of image enhancement uh, or image uh, deblurring programs out there. To deblur an image, it's, you know, you can't just take the image and plug it in and uh, there's no magic deblurring algorithm. You have to know what causes the blurring. So what causes blurring? Well, it's, you're either moving the camera while you're capturing the image or the thing, that, something that you're capturing is moving. And if you can mathematically describe what is causing that blur, then you can apply that algorithm to deblur the image. So find a mathematical description of how the image was blurred, and then you can deblur it. This is an example of, of, that I found. Um, this, this is a, a blurry picture of a woman's face. This, is, uh, this image down here kind of sh will show you the deblurring process. 
And then the last image will actually show you the final picture. So, I mean, that's pretty good. I mean, to, to have an image like that fixed up pretty, that's, that's a pretty good uh, image to be blurring here. So how can we apply this to crime? Well, say you saw uh, uh, this, uh, again, these are other images that were, that were actually de-blurred. Say you, uh, uh, one of the, some camera on a street corner caught this, you know, vehicle fleeing from the scene of a crime. Well, what can you tell me about that vehicle from that picture? It's probably white or light colored. Some sort of state. I mean, you can get some basic data. What if you had this picture? It's a taxi cab. It's got a... Um, a clover leaf on the side, you may, you can maybe even, you know, so you know the, the exact cab company, you know, the by the advertisement on the roof, you may be able to determine the exact cab that was involved. I mean, so here's a case where image deblurring can really give you a lot of important information. Excuse me. Yes. Um, can you explain what you're asking? I'm not, I'm not following. I was talking about the image de I didn't know if, you, if there was a difference between the type of cameras. In other words, if I mount a, cam a camera that's stationary on a building, it's not going to move, not going to move the wind, versus if I have a PTZ security camera that could be rotating for 90 degrees. Right. What kind of image de I mean, sure, a really good example here. Right. Um, you're probably going to have to go frame by frame. So you may be able to extract individual frames from that image and then, you know, de-blur them. I don't, I, I, obviously, I don't have any data on that, so I don't know. Like, you could do the, uh, if you know the speed of the scanner in the camera, that would be your mathematical. Well, yeah, if you can, if you can eliminate the panning going on, then that, then that will also help, help that. Here's a very touchy subject, and I know Thorne will add on to this. De-blurring fingerprints. So, Oftentimes, you'll get a fingerprint and, and it doesn't, it's too blurry to find any, you know, minutia points to match. So, so can we use de-blurring to, to fix up a fingerprint so it might actually provide some information? Well, by de-blurring a fingerprint, are, are we adding non-existent details to the print that weren't already there? I mean, that would be, that, now you're kind of almost fabricating evidence. So typically any enhancement of a fingerprint or otherwise has to be ver verifiable and duplicated by another expert in the field. And now we're talking about, you know, you know scientific, scientific evidence being admissible in court. For example, a polygraph examination is typically not admissible in court because it's not generally accepted. But some scientific techniques are admissible in court. And I know Frank will add, will add some to that. Yeah, I just wanted to say... Having worked in the forensic lab where, where we're looking at fingerprints like this, some of the examiners I know will not even look at anything that has been put through any kind of image manipulation because they feel that it's so risky to themselves as an examiner and to potentially convicting someone. Uh, in court, fingerprint evidence is perceived as being very, very uh, positive. Um, but they don't want to put that themselves or the, the other people, the, the defendant, at risk of that kind of conviction. So they won't even look at his stuff. If they can't lift a print using dust or photograph it in blood or something like that, they're not even going to look at it. They just don't believe in this stuff anymore, right, at all. And, and really the risk in, in, in crossing the line between enhancing the image and manipulating it is, is really dependent upon the tools that you're going to use. You know, your magic tool that's going to make the image perfect is probably going to cross the line. So, it, it particularly, you'll see in fingerprint enhancement that you're talking about very small changes in enhancing the image. We'll also talk a little bit about fingerprint matching. So, you've, you've got a set of fingerprints and you're going to run them through APHIS, which is Automated Fingerprint Identification System. And, you, you know, the TV scene is, you know, the detective walks over to the guy running the machine, they plug it in, and, you know, the guy's probably walking away when the, when the match comes up on the screen, and, and the detective turns around, and boom, you've got your, you know, you've got your, uh, your, your criminal found. Well, 
you'd be surprised there's, there's about four or five different major vendors of APHIS systems, and all these vendors use very different matching algorithms. You think it might be standard. It's not. There's also 10 different fingerprint individuality models that are used. There's minutia matching versus pattern matching. There's speed and throughput versus accuracy, and I'll talk a little bit about this on, the, on one of the next slides, as well as error rates in terms of false positives, false reject rates, um, the crossover or error rate, and I'll talk a little, little bit about that on the, on the next slide. I think it's the next slide. When you talk about um, error rates, you're talking, you need to know what sort of application you're using. You know, so, and so we're talking about your receiver. High, in, in a typical high security access environment, so you're, now you're talking about, you know, you want someone's fingerprint scan to gain access to a high security facility. Well, you want a high false reject rate because you don't want that. You'd rather have someone have to do it three times to get in. Ex you don't want false positives. In other words, you don't want people to be admitted that aren't ac don't actually have access. Forensic applications, forensic science applications, typically you want a, f a higher false acceptance rate. In other words, when you run that print through APHIS, you're going to probably end up with, you know, 50 or 100 or more possible matches that are going to have to be brought out, and now the latent examiner is going to have to go through by hand and find out. So you probably want those false positives. So depending upon your application, you know, your algorithm is going to be somewhere on this curve. For a forensic application, you're probably going to be want more to the right. However, if you have a biometric application for a security access, you want it more in the, uh, up in that area. And then depending, whatever, so depending upon your application determines where you're going to be on that chart. This is an example of, of a fingerprint classification algorithm. This is very simplistic. But basically what this algorithm is doing is classifying fingerprints based on the type of fingerprint you have, whether you have whorls or arches or loops. Or, and so the program is basically just going to go through it and, and put people into bins based on the type of fingerprints you have. And even something like this is going to misidentify some or not be able to identify some. So again, you're going to have to go through those and say, you know, okay, the computer said it was this or the computer couldn't identify this, um, so we're going to have to do it by hand. But it, it helps you to sift through mountains of data. And we'll talk a little bit about that later in terms of using, using it for management data. And this is just an example uh, of APHIS matching a print. In, uh, it's kind of difficult to see, but there are actually green arrows pointing to the different minutia points that are being matched on this fingerprint to show the, mat, the, ten, or the 10 or so different matches between these two prints. Let's, let's go a little bit further into, into, uh, into where math is maybe, maybe a stretch into helping out, but maybe can give us some pointers. Escape math. Someone escapes from a facility or someone is escaping from a crime scene. How can we determine where they're going or what direction they're going or where we might be able to find that person? Well, there's, there's a lot of variables here, and this is what makes escape math so difficult. First of all, that probably the two most important variables in escape math are time, how long has it been since this person escaped, and then the method of travel. Do we know they only can, are they in an area where we know they can only be walking or running? That may help. You know, if there's a subway station right next door to where he escaped, that, that kind of, that really complicates the math. And that can find out our achievable speeds. If they're in a dense forest, and there's no civilization around for 50 miles, well, you can calculate that this guy's only be able to go two or three or four or whatever miles per hour, and you can probably set up a perimeter to, to catch this guy. Also, what traffic density, uh, choke points that are in the area, all these things complicate the math. We'll talk about a few different ways in which we might be able to find out where someone's going. Do they have a specific destination in mind? Do you know that they're trying to get to a specific area? Well, there's an algorithm called Dijkstra's algorithm, which can, which can give you the shortest path between two points. And you may think this is obvious, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's an algorithm. When you go into MapQuest or Google Maps and you say, I want to go from 
you know, State College, Pennsylvania, to uh, Washington, D.C., uh, MapQuest is actually using a Dijkstra algorithm from both ends to determine the shortest path. And essentially, it's, it's calculating a value of the links between each city or each town. What's the fastest way to go based upon traffic conditions, based upon the speed that I can achieve on that road? If you're familiar with, uh, with you know, link state routing protocols like Open Shortest Path First, that uses Dijkstra's algorithm. So there's an application directly in the computer field. Another way you could possibly find out where some, uh, how far someone could go is something called a random walk, which I'll show a slide of later. And a random walk is simply an experiment where someone's taking a step forward to the left or right, and every time is, is doing that again. So left or right, left or right, left or right. And this was actually used, random walks were actually used to calculate how far prisoners of war could travel if the, after they escaped from prison camps in, in World War II. You may have also heard this known as the drunkard's walk, or, you know, there are some applications, if you've heard of Brownian motion, which uh, Bruce actually mentioned and two people laughed at in the opening talk. There's also something called the trawler problem, which I'll show you a slide of. And then if you, if you, if you have something like map point, you can, you can use drive time calculations. So you can pick a point on a map and say, how far can somebody drive in 10 minutes or 15 minutes? And that'll give you an estimate of, of where they can get to. Now, none of these things are going are gonna, to are gonna give you a point on a map where the person is, but they may narrow down the area that you have to search, which is really the point here. Yeah, I just want to say, it, this is the point where some of the cops on the street are going to go, this is bullshit. Absolutely. Yeah. They are not going to believe that you can pull up on a map and tell you where a, someone is. Now, they may be able to do it based on experience and knowing traffic patterns and stuff like this, but they're probably not going to be real comfortable with the idea that math can actually predict out where someone is going to show up. And they're probably right in that regard, and a lot of times. It may get better, but right now, state of the art is such that they're not going to be able to say, a bad guy is now here at this point because we, we plug these things in. Absolutely. And, and another tool that you can use is perhaps social network analysis, and we'll talk about this later as in, a, in a few different aspects. Kind of time, I'll speed up a little bit. Uh, I wouldn't say that. The cops tend to be um, somewhat uh, skeptical of a lot of stuff. It seems like there's a statistics problem, too, getting that analysis done and back into the cops so they can actually... Absolutely. Well, that, yeah, the question was about the logistics of this stuff, and that's absolutely true because this stuff does not get analyzed like it does on CSI or any of those things. It just it doesn't happen that quick. So here, here's, this is Google Maps, this is State College, Pennsylvania, to, to, to this hotel, stopping in Lancaster, you know, at, to visit my friend, and, and this, is the, this is the shortest path, this tells me the quickest way to get there. This is a random walk, these are seven different random walks starting out, and you see that, you know, they, they end up across the whole spectrum in, in terms of, of how far someone could go in a random walk. This is the trawler problem. Um, you're on a, you know, a, a criminal escapes from an island prison in, in a rowboat, and they're going in one direction, but you don't know what direction they're going. What's, what's the mathematical way to find out where they're going? Well, if you're, if you're, you know, super security speedboat, which needs to be, you know, significantly faster than their rowboat, is actually to spiral out, because no matter what point the person went from, as long as they're going in the same direction, you're going to eventually catch them. So again, can you apply this to a city and find someone? Probably not, but it kind of gives you an idea of, you know, of being able to find something. It kind of gives you an idea of where to focus. Narrowing the suspect pool, you know, how do you do that? Well, profiling, you see, you see a lot of, of psychological profiling, especially of serial crimes. And we'll talk later about, about geographic profiling, and that's kind of the uh, section that we'll discuss later. And this is just simple Venn diagrams. You know, if someone has, if someone, if you have different, you might have three suspect pools, and, and, and where they overlap might be the ones you want to concentrate on. So it's just a good example of where, of something that's really already being done, but, you know, event, but they're just using Venn diagrams in a different way. 
talk really briefly about social network analysis. Google PageRank is an example of, of network analysis. If you go, uh, when you go to a certain page, if you go to, Yahoo, if you go from Google, type in ShmooCon, go to the ShmooCon webpage, or go to Yahoo and type in ShmooCon and go to the ShmooCon webpage, both times you do that, you're, you're sending a vote for Google or a vote for Yahoo into the algorithm. Now that vote is weighted differently based on you know, how big the page is, so the weight for Google is probably more. So that makes the page more popular. But essentially, uh, you can map this out to see what are the most popular pages out there. Well, that's not something that you, just, you, know, that you can use for that. You can use that for organized crime, gangs, terrorist cells, other organizations. And what you're doing is you're mapping social relationships in terms of nodes and ties. You can also perhaps determine the social capital of individual actors. And you can find perhaps, if we take out this one person, can we collapse this network if there's no one to replace him? Pretty interesting stuff. So who are, the fr who are, who are someone's closest friends and associates? This may help in escape math. If we know that ha they have certain friends in a certain area, they may be going to those places. Where might that person go to? Could you eliminate a specific individual from a certain group to cause an organization to collapse? This is a social network of a project team. They had just missed a, a deadline. And uh, this is actually an email social network analysis. Each color was a, different, uh, was a different department that was working on this project. And what they, when, they, when they saw this, what they found was that none of the, project, none of the teams were working together. You know, and you can see by this map that the blue team is, all the teams are basically by themselves and not interacting with one another. And they actually used this to determine that they needed to work together more and they actually, you know, went on to complete the project. So how do we apply this to math? Well, this is a social network analysis of, of some of the 9-11 terrorists. Most of the terror cells were suspected to be very autonomous, did not have leaders, um, and after this network analysis was done, you can find that certain people, like for example in the top left there, Mohammed Atta, were actually very central to the network. And they found that the 9-11 terror cells were actually very similar to, you know, your typical IBM project team, where, it, you know, so it, it's, it, was, it basically bucked the conventional wisdom on, on, um, on terror cells at the time. Yeah, I just want to say, these kinds of... Um those kinds of diagrams. We use these all the time in organized crime profiling uh, to determine the organizational chart. And there's actually some really good software out there right now that will sift through. If you put in someone's name and their known associates, it starts doing link analysis like this automatically. And you can build these things up and it actually discovers relationships you never knew existed. So for organized crime, uh, drug uh, groups, all that kind of stuff, gangs, this stuff is actually one of the things that detectives now swear by. I'm going to keep going fast. Forward. Talk uh, about crime mapping. This is a chloropleth. This was from France in 1829. And this was kind of like the first example of crime mapping. And this was mapping property crime by region in France. So you could kind of determine where was the most crime going on. This is an example of a, a map that was made uh, by a doctor in London in 1854 during a cholera plague. Um, the map um, demonstrated that almost all the deaths were surrounding one particular well in this neighborhood. And big surprise, when they turned off the well, all the deaths stopped. Um, but, you know, even at that time, there was no evidence that people were still skeptical that, that water was the carrying source for cholera. And this was kind of the first, this is considered one of the seminal events in the, in the entire field of epidemiology. So a good example now where, of where maps help someone to, you know, solve a problem. NYPD has been used in pin mapping since at least 1900. The University of Chicago mapped crime in Chicago neighborhoods in the 20s and 30s. And what you're trying to do is identify a relationship between crime and, and different neighborhoods and whether you cannot find where crime exists more often than, than somewhere else. Late 1960s, this process started to become automated, but however, it did not really take off until the 90s. The first example of, of mapping crime was hotspot analysis, so finding concentrations of crime. And then we'll talk about profiling. If psychological profiling tells you who might have done it, geographical profiling tells you perhaps where it took place. And this just shows you that, 
that uh, automated crime mapping has increased, you know, almost exponentially since the 19, early 1980s. This is a hotspot analysis of Newark, uh, New Jersey. It's pretty obvious where most of the crime is taking place. How is, this useful, how is this useful to a police officer? Well, you can determine where you want to focus your efforts. This is hotspot analysis of, of Washington, D.C. in a two-year period, 1994 to 1995. Uh, all the dots indicate murder locations. You will notice that there is only one murder west of Rock Creek, and you are west of Rock Creek now, so you're in one of the safer portions of Washington, D.C. True. <laughs> so geographic profiling can tell you where. This, I want to make this point. This is very important. This is suitable for serial crimes. So you're talking about three, four, five, perhaps more crimes where you can use this. Murder, rape, robbery, arson, other predatory crimes. This is not going to tell you the house that the guy lives in. This is going to help you sift the mountains of data to a manageable point. This also doesn't replace traditional investigative techniques. This supplements them. These are pro I'm sorry I'm going fast. We're running out of time. These are some of the programs that are out there that, that, that do this sort of thing. This is based upon journey to crime, how far people travel to commit crimes. Typically, criminals, typically, the criminals leave a buffer or zone around their house but stay relatively close to where they live and where they're familiar with. And then the principle of least effort. If, you're, if your gas tank's just about empty in your car, all the gas stations in town cost the same price. Where are you going to go? Whatever's closest or more convenient to. And, and typically, criminals do the same thing. This is a series of serial arson cases in British Columbia. These were the locations of the arsons. This was a, a Jeopardy surface which basically predicted where the guy might be located. This is applying it to the map. That's where the guy lived. And that was his parole office. <laughs> this, was, this was done by a man named Dr. Kim Rosmo who really, prof who really you know, pioneered the technique of ge geographic profiling. He also did an interesting analysis of perhaps where the killer of Jack the Ripper, where, where Jack the Ripper might have lived. And some of the most, some of the most uh, serious suspects do in fact live right in that, that dark orange area. So we, uh, back in uh, December and in January, uh, there was a series of, of delivery truck robberies that were going on in Reading, Pennsylvania, where I grew up. So we've, we decided, let's, let's see if we can at least you know, on an amateur level, predict what's going on. These were the locations of, of the delivery truck robberies. We started an analyzing this about halfway through, about five or six crimes into the estimated 11 or 10 or 11 that actually took place. This is what's called a, uh, a convex hull. It's basically, if you put pins in a map, this would be putting a rubber band around all the pins. You know, typically, typically offenders live within that zone. That's the center. These are the areas that, that Without doing any other analysis, these are the areas that we first came up with that would be the probable offender areas. Um, the bottom one was what, was what Thorne said. I, I basically eliminated that area based on, and this is where knowledge of the area comes into play. W once, I, once I told him that that's a commercial and government, there's very few people that actually live there, you know, we can eliminate that area. And the other area in the center there uh, again, a, a more upscale neighborhood, not likely to have a, someone involved there. So, you know, this was my focus right here. Not only, was, not only did it fit the profile of, of where the crimes are being committed, but it's, it's a very crime-ridden neighborhood. Those are where the two offenders live. So we got pretty close on one. The other one we were, were considerably far off on. However, we don't have all the data. We're going from newspaper reports. Were they both living in the same house? Um, did they work in a different location? We don't have information that the investigators had, but we came pretty close on one of them, you know, right on the border of where we suspected that they might live. I'm not going to go through these. These are just other examples of where you could possibly use, use math to help some crime, and now I'll turn it over to Frank for the last section. Okay. So I said back in the beginning we were going to come back to... Um, NYPD and why they're kind of the leader in a lot of these things. Um, in our first submission on this paper, we had asked, you know, is the minority report something that's eventually going to come about? And in some ways, the future is now. We have what's known as the real-time crime center that NYPD came up with. Um, they, they actually put this thing together a few years ago. 
It's a center. The room is something about the size of this room. Uh, it's got huge projectors. It ties a bunch of databases together. It's got 26 member staff that are on 24 hours a day. They're available for hot crimes. Um, they actually, uh, if you look on IBM's site, IBM was one of the big contributors to the project, and they have some stuff about how they, they tie together an armed robbery based on the <coughs> same description of the tattoo. There's a pretty good video out there. It's a commercial for IBM, to be sure, but it is pretty good video of how it works. Um, they can bring these teams together very quickly uh, and pull up data that's available. That's what it looks like. Any resemblance to uh, the NORAD uh, center is probably intentional. You know, it's it's a war room when you get right down to it. So what it what it's doing is it's basically tying together approximately five million New York State criminal records, parole and other violation records, uh, twenty million New York City criminal complaints and 9-11 and 3-11 calls that all come in. And also a, a whole variety of other public records. So what happens is a crime is committed, they get some information, they start sifting through all this stuff very, very quickly <coughs> using the data warehouse, and they're able to, in a lot of cases, pull up a good list of suspects, eliminating a lot of the stuff of those false positives I was talking about at the beginning that the cops have to sift through. The sifting is done for. They can then go out with a good collection of, of, hopefully a good collection, of narrowed down suspects and start working that stuff. So that's kind of what I think what we're going to see in the future is to how most police departments are going to start functioning. You're going to start pulling these things together in these kinds of same centers. I don't think you're going to see it down on a smaller PD level, but you're probably going to start seeing regional and state systems much like this. Uh, so the question is on, you know, whether we priority report, can we actually pull that together? I don't think so. But I think we can be a lot more efficient in pulling investigations together using a lot of these tools. Um, the cops are coming around and learning that, in fact, data is information, and information solves investigations. And ultimately, it means better policing. To be sure, you have to watch the watchers. You have to pay attention to what the cops are looking at all the time and making sure that it's in, in tied into criminal stuff and it's not a violation of privacy. But this is the way it's going if we're going to be solving crimes in the future. Anything to add? No, that's pretty much it. Um, we're, we're pretty much out of time. Um, we will be more than happy to step outside the door here so we can let Render set up and, and answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Just, and just a reminder to everybody, we are all caught up on all the on-site DVDs, so if anybody's interested in any of them, they're outside of the break-it room. Um, they're $20 a piece, uh, 8 for 100 or the full set of uh, 40 discs, I think is 350